all of us struggle with who we are sometimes. This is harder for some, more than it is for others. Generally, we take our gender and identity for granted. But what if we didn't fit into the male or female labels we were assigned at birth? This is the story and opinions of three people as they search for a sense of their own identity, Sit. strive for acceptance, and continue to battle against their own government to be simply recognised in their true gender. Nineteen-year-old Sam Blankenisi is studying veterinary nursing at UCD and has spent his whole life in the family home in Greystones, Wicklow. But I would have been very active in the town when I was younger. I was in Scouts for 12 years and I sang with every musical society in the town and in the church choir and I was an altar server. And then this kind of the couple of uh, times where it was like, it was pointed out that I wasn't as good as the boys as a girl and kind of, I, I remember getting very upset about that. Um, but most of the time I just tried to keep to myself like because I didn't really understand the other girls and I didn't quite fit in with the boys either. So Sam attended a nearby mixed primary school, but when he was in fifth class, he started to encounter problems. I started going to, uh, to a, an all-girls school when I was like 12 because I was being so badly bullied in my mixed school that or not even badly bullied, but just really isolated. Like, at the time I thought it was bullying, but now it's probably just isolation. Um, but I had no friends at all, and when I went into sixth, sixth class, I went into an all-girls school. Well, when I was in third year, it was kind of just me noticing girls. I mean, I'd never really noticed guys, but when I started to notice girls, it was it was kind of really scary, um, especially as I said that I'm I was quite religious. I was very into the church and at the time I was still an altar server. I was in the church choir. So the idea of liking girls was kind of terrifying and it took me so long to kind of even admit that. And I lost a load of friends when I came out as at the time gay, but I lost so many friends uh, who just didn't understand it or were very prejudiced against it. But even after coming out as gay, Sam was still questioning his identity. It wasn't until he made a good friend from the LBGT community that things started to make sense. Later on that year, Andy came out to me. And I'd already been really thinking about it, but we'd had so much in common. We really thought the same way. And when Andy came out, it was just, oh, OK, we, we're really similar. I should possibly think about this a bit. And then as it kind of went on, I was like, yeah, no, I really identify with the idea of being trans and started doing like sm like small steps, but quite quickly uh, and started binding. Like the first thing I tried to do was bind. And like I, I, I have a video somewhere of me binding for the first time and just seeing what it looked like. Binding is a process that Sam uses to flatten his breast tissue in order to create a male appearing chest. Try to move up to the ceiling. Hopefully it looks pretty good. I think so anyway. That video kind of shows the kind of really how fast I kind of came around to the idea because it just fits so well. And that's the advice that I'll actually give anyone who comes out to me now or says that I might be questioning it, like do things and see if, you, if you're comfortable with them. And I just happened to be comfortable with pretty much everything I tried. And then kind of telling a couple of friends. But like they really understood it when I came out as trans because it made so much more sense to my year who had never really understood me in the first place that, oh, right, yeah. I mean, he's looked kind of like a guy for the last two years. This makes so much sense as to why he's acting so masculine. If he was just gay, it wouldn't make any sense, but this really does. Louise Hannan lives in inner city Dublin, but grew up in rural Ulster. She was an only child and brought up in a conservative family home. I always felt different. I always felt different. Uh, oh God, I go going back. 11, 12, 13 and before it, 
I always felt, you know, I never was into the rough and tumble of boys sports, all this sort of stuff. I just did not feel that was me. Um, and looking back over the years, all my best friends were female. I had very, very few male friends because I just basically felt very uncomfortable in the male environment. At the age of 16, I wanted to do fashion design uh, linked with photography. And my mother and father wouldn't hear a word of it. I went off to an agricultural college and I um, stayed there for quite a while, but unfortunately my father took very ill. And uh, I felt as an only child it was my duty to come back and look after the place for him. And I did that uh, for about six years till he died. And in some ways, I really, really don't regret that. But it set me on a path where I ended up with, uh, I suppose, a direction that I couldn't change very easily. Louise got married and had children of her own. But over the years, she knew she was not living her life to its full potential. Well, about 15 years ago, I was very low. Um, to the point where I was ready to commit suicide. Um, for a long, long time, I, I didn't know what was wrong. I had been abused as a child, sexually abused. And I had this morbid fear that I would turn out to be a, an abuser of some sort. And it got to the point where I just didn't know where to turn. And then I went to a counselling service and they helped me a great deal over about six months. But I had to stop that because at that point I couldn't actually move forward. I couldn't transition, I couldn't do anything. And I found the pain of that and the, and the recall of, of all the pain of that more and more difficult as the weeks went on. And, and I was able to stick that for nearly six months and then I stopped. But during that six months, I realised that I had to go and do something about it. It was only when I separated, when my children were growing up, that I actually realised that I had the chance now to do what I wanted to do. And I did. Um, and, and a few years later, I was able to live as I am now. And that's, what, that's something I'm extremely grateful for. Although Sam was now comfortable being out as trans with his close friends, coming out to his parents was something he spent a long time worrying over, until one day he finally found the words to tell them. All right, so this is the letter I used to come out to my parents. Uh, I wrote it in, like, when I was just finished fifth year, uh, so I was about 17. And, yeah, I, gave, I threw it at them one evening. Uh, so it goes like this. Dear Mum and Dad, I don't know how to tell you this other than by writing it down, but I'm transgender. I want to transition from female to male. I don't change, plan on changing who I am, my personality, my likes and my dislikes. None of that will change. What will I hope is my name. My birth name isn't suitable for a guy. The pronouns you used to refer to me and also some biological changes. I didn't come to this conclusion overnight. I have never felt comfortable as female. I want you to see it's not that you're losing a daughter, but rather that you've always really had a son. I don't want this to hurt you, but I understand that this will be really hard for you and that you'll probably take some time to accept it. Your son, Sam. Sam's parents, Simon and Deirdre, had gone through the coming out process twice before with Sam, but this time it was different. The fact he, he'd come out as being bi and then gay and now as transgender, you kind of felt, oh, this is another, you know, kind of where is this going? And uh, I suppose I, first of all, I had to find out, we to find out what transgender was. But initially it was kind of, all right, OK, <laughs> this is what we're dealing with. OK, it now all makes sense. But at the time, um, I just had to come to terms with it, basically, mm -hmm. to be honest. It's a whole mindset in itself, you kind of, but now it comes quite naturally, but at the time it was kind of, yeah, it's difficult to change and, yeah, because you, you had, like, my eldest child was a daughter, and born a daughter, and you, you do have a process of getting through that, and um, I think as a mother, you know, um, it takes time, and it, it has to take time, because, you, you know, you've, you know, you've given birth to a child, and, like, my eldest 
child was a, was a girl. And you have to get, get the fact that that child is exactly the same. You still have the same child, but um, he's now a boy. It's been a really progressive like two years from them really not getting it, really not wanting it to happen, to like slowly giving like inch by inch like me freedom and then eventually coming around to accept me completely and support me entirely. Kay Bear Koss, originally from Indiana, came to Ireland in 2004. Since then, she has been creating and exhibiting her own art, as well as co-founding the Irish Museum of Contemporary Art and a large studio network. I always knew, even growing up, when I was three, I, my, my first toy that I asked for and my mom got me was a kitchen playset and I had dolls and I wanted to be with the girls. And But then, growing up in Indiana and Michigan in the 70s, the, the word transgender didn't even exist. And I've, I certainly never heard it. So I had an older brother and a father. And, and so you're trying to make sense of what you're feeling and you see that everyone sort of identifies you with them and not the other little girls, so you just assume that that's the way you're supposed to act and those are the things that you're supposed to be interested in. And it's like, uh, an analogy I've used before is after, after playing that role for so long, I imagine it's like being an actor who's on a long running TV show like Cheers or MASH and somebody goes, hey Norm, and the actor turns around instinctively because he's, he's uh, uh, internalized that role so much that it's almost a part of him. Um, so on a very conscious level, perhaps for a while in a period in your life, you forget that. It's always there though unconsciously and obviously everyone has a different experience like when they come out and who they come out to. But so. I can't really speak for anyone else, so I should just say, in my experience, I had an incredible amount of frustration and, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, like self-hatred, and I um, put myself in very, um, uh, as like manly, uh, macho uh, positions as possible, and took risks and uh, uh, yeah, a lot of risk taking and really nihilistic behavior. And I almost lost my best friend because he's like, what is going on with you? You know, if you don't talk to me, this is it. I'm walking. I'm not going to be your friend anymore. And then I, I realized that I had to share with somebody. And so I think he was the first person I told. It's just like popping a balloon and all that extra um, pressure is off. And so it feels good to be able to do that and to be authentic and to live authentically, which is, you know, I guess the um, not doing that was eating me up inside. And so that, that kind of led to um, telling people. And maybe I still hadn't quite decided to, um, to do something about it other than just talk about it, uh, uh, except that I um, was in a motorcycle accident. Um, and uh, I was, it was two in one day, actually. I, got hit uh, from behind, uh, bumped me. I didn't even fall over, but it really jolted me and, and got back on the bike and went down the road. And in less than three blocks, this car pulled out from around a bus and uh, broadsided me and I went flying over the handlebars. And um, I was midair, time froze like it does in those situations. And I thought, you know what, if you walk away from this, you're not going to get another chance. So you better do something and change your life if you want to be happy. And I landed on my back in the middle of Thomas Street. The bike was totaled and had to be towed away. The car had to be towed away. I got up. I dusted myself off. I didn't have a scratch on me. I kind of took that as a sign that, OK, you've been given a second chance. Do something. Transitioning is a process through which some transgender people begin to live as the gender with which they identify, rather than the one assigned at birth. Transitioning can mean different things to different people, from transitioning socially, legally and physically. A lot of trans males feel like they must bind their chest in order to pass as male, but over time, 
Binding can cause its own set of problems. So these are all my binders, other than the one I've got on. <laughs> um, they're quite interesting, seeing as they all look so different from each other. And even the one I've on is kind of like t-shirt material rather than anything else. Um, the one I have on, I have on is kind of like this stuff underneath like a tank top. A binding's really bad for you. The pros is it makes you look the way you want. Cons are like you can't breathe properly in them. Uh, you can break ribs. You can like I developed asthma from wearing them too much. Uh, like uh, I know a friend who will possibly need heart surgery because it's cut off the circulation to his to his heart uh, vessels, the blood vessels in his heart. Uh, they're really really bad for you. Uh, because it doesn't allow your chest to expand and it's like it'll kill off all the tissue in your chest and like it'll kill off nerves and whatever so it becomes less painful to wear but also it just damages you over and over again. I'd say that unless you have to don't start binding like unless you really have to for your mental health like it's just it's not worth the risk you're putting in your health. Uh, like it's it's so dangerous and it's not as if like if you don't like if you don't do it too tightly you don't do as much damage but it's not as if you don't do damage at all like after two years you've got permanent damage the transition process can be a complex one not only medically physically and emotionally but legally too we are currently sitting in a situation where we're the last country in Europe to legally recognise transgender people. Um, and, and I think that's an absolute disgrace because in 1992, uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, passed a judgment and that then brought in, with a domino effect, all the different um, legal recognition uh, legislation bills right throughout Europe. And as I say, we are now the last one to actually have that enacted. As well as being heavily involved in advocacy with the Transgender Equality Network, Louise is also the Vice Chair of Labour LGBT, as she and fellow members constantly strive to bring about equal rights. Everywhere we go without legal recognition, um, if you need a birth certificate for whatever purpose, whether it's going to a college or whether it's, it's doing anything, um, without having your, your, your proper birth certificate, everywhere you go, you will be showing a birth certificate that's a totally op the opposite to the way you actually present to, to, the, to the, the, the person who needs the birth certificate. A lot of people um, who are transgender, they want to live normal lives. They don't want to have their past brought up every time they go to do something which needs a birth certificate. And that's extremely important. Everything needs to be put into the correct gender in the way that the person's presenting to the world. And that's the way everybody else has it, so we should have that as well. When the legislation goes through, it, um, it will mean a lot uh, for virtually every transgender person in Ireland. For me, it will mean that the state where I um, live and support and pay my taxes actually recognises me as, as a legitimate member of um, society. And that, for me, is extremely important. Both Louise and Sam have changed their names by deep poll here in Ireland. But for Kay, it's been a bit more complicated. So tonight is the big night we've been building up to this for the last two months. Um, we, I finally approached the uh, uh, the district court where my birth certificate would be on file back in the States and my mother's been a big help. Um, she's going to be standing in court at 3 p.m. in Indiana and 9 p.m. here. Um, so I've had all day to worry about this and uh, we will be um, petitioning for a legal name and gender change. For me the name changing process uh, has been fairly easy because I'm not really changing my name that much. Um, my my original name was Curtis, uh, but I was named after my my uh, grandfather, and he had always said, but he was spelled with a C, and they spelled my name with a K because he said, 
that was the one his one regret he always wanted his name spelled with a K so I never re obviously I didn't ever really uh, affiliate with my name it never felt right of course um, so I usually went by my middle name bear and um, and then I started going by K bear and that stuck and so it was really easy to think that well the K was the only thing that was important to him and the name isn't really that important to me so I just started spelling it out as K-A-Y instead of K. So it went from K-Bear to K-A-Y Bear. I think my mom was a little sad that her dad's name was going to disappear, but overall I think they just want me to be happy. She wouldn't be standing in court for me if, if she wasn't okay with it. So. Unfortunately for Kay, this court has never had to deal with such a request before, so she has no way of knowing what the outcome will be. Are you there? Yes, I am. My petitioner is present. Okay, well, if you raise your hand. Okay, well, sure, I'll raise my hand over here. There we go. Okay, swear affirm the penalty of perjury that what you're about to say is the truth? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you are changing your name. I, for the record, for what reason? Um, so it appropriately reflects my gender, and I was hoping that we were going to be changing that on my paperwork as well. I am going to order your name to be Kaylee Bear. <coughs> Thank you, Your uh, Honor. And also to direct the Indiana State Department of Health. <laughs> Thank you so much. <sighs> It's okay, Kaylee. It's okay, Kaylee. Thank you so much. Love you, Kaylee. <laughs> Bye. It's, it's, it's 9 p.m. here. I've had to wait all day. <laughs> well, now it is the weekend, so I want you to go out on the plate of Guinness. Oh. Or the Davidson for me, I think. Oh, thank you so much. God, that was nerve-wracking. <sighs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> now I'm going to have to do my makeup again before I go out and meet my friends. <sighs> Sam has always enjoyed being on stage and this year has decided to perform a very personal piece at the Transgender Equality Network event for Pride. This has got to get it out of my head, so it's uh, Tenny's kind of mental health piece for Pride. So what I'm doing in it is I'm going to be singing a song out on the stage and then I'm also going to be singing here later on. So I'll be singing The Doctor and I, which is kind of uh, myself and my boyfriend's <laughs> going to take on The Wizard and I from Wicked. So we've changed a couple of the words up and made them kind of suit ourselves. I'm really nervous uh, because my voice is breaking because I went on, I started testosterone three months ago. And because I've only started testosterone, I'm kind of like, I've got about the vocal range of a 15 year old boy at the moment. So it's going to be quite interesting to see whether my voice breaks during the song or, uh, or not. And I've also got a bit of a cold, which kind of adds to it. <laughs> and to have Sayla here is amazing because he lives so far away, and the fact that he's here for the summer and can be here for this is amazing. And it's not only Sam's boyfriend that was there to help support him on the night. It's just amazing to have that support, because so many of my friends, kind of, their family are kind of like, yeah, we love you no matter what, but my family are like, yeah, we love you no matter what, and we're going to get involved in your life as much as we possibly can to support you and to fight for your rights as much as we can, which is really cool. Unlimited. My future is unlimited. It's really empowering to be surrounded by so many like-minded people and so many people fighting for the same cause. And I think that's why I enjoy Pride so much. It's kind of everyone coming together to really show who we are and kind of make LGBT something that's really celebrated rather than something that can kind of be discriminated against. It's something that's a really great part of you. Uh, it went okay. A couple of, couple of mistakes, because I guess with the lack of practice and the voices being all over the place, I started off at the female range and then had to drop down 
enough that I could sing. Uh, but no, it went really well, so especially with the lack of practice. The end ended up sounding really good, whereas the start probably didn't. <laughs>
you know, a new lease of life um, from talking to my other friends who've had their transitions and various surgeries that they just, they just feel like they're born again. It's just the way they should have been. Binding is not good for his health at all. I mean, physically it's really not very good. He's on inhalers, he's got back problems, he's seeing a chiropractor. Um, binding is supposed to minimise the amount you bind. But like if he's going to college, he could be leaving here at seven o'clock in the morning. He might not be back till 10 or 11 at night. So he's binding for that length of time. It's really not good at all. And it just, um, it goes against the whole kind of looking after him, knowing that he's binding, knowing he has to bind. It's not a choice. He, it's just, he won't go out the door unless he binds. I think my family's gonna be able to stop worrying about me once I have surgery. Uh, so I get to stop binding and I get to stop like doing myself damage. And I think they're just so relieved that I'm not going to be kind of hurting myself anymore. Well, we're looking for some days off and get the following week. Yeah. So we're sort of quiet. And then yeah. the friends. As well as studying full time, Sam also works part time in a local pet store. They've been amazing. Like any issues have been solved like ridiculously fast and like everyone has been fantastic about pronouns. And at the start, they didn't really know what to make of it. And then eventually they kind of figured out that it was just kind of another part of me and everyone's really cool. I mean, you get the odd question from people kind of being really curious about what it is, what I'm going through and any like medical stuff. But it's really curiosity rather than anything else. In the past, Sam found his job physically challenging, but after five months on hormones and now with his upcoming chest surgery booked, he is looking forward to the future. Since I've gone on testosterone, lifting has become an awful lot easier because I've got a lot more strength. It's going to be an awful lot easier because I won't be binding. Um, because currently I don't have the full uh, like breath capacity that I should have. And like it's even the uniform, it can be quite tight. So like it's going to be nice to not have to worry about that, like not have to worry about how my chest looks in the uniform. So it's, it's really cool to be able to like know that after that like I'm just going to be another guy in work and there's no kind of trans aspect at all. Both Sam and Kay have so far not come against any conflict or discrimination in the workplace, but Louise has not been so fortunate. Well the transition in the workplace was meant to be smooth but it didn't actually turn out that way. I'd had discussions from before Christmas 2006 around when I would transition and what the conditions would be afterwards. Um, and then when I actually did transition um, in March of that year, of the following year, uh, the conditions were changed arbitrarily. And I find myself going out to see clients um, in male mode, going home to change and coming back into the office as female. Uh, things like that. Um, then I was asked to work from home because there was a, an atmosphere in the office. So I worked from home instead of a month, which it was meant to be, and my salary was increased, bonus was increased. Um, that turned into four months. And then I was told, I think you should go and get another job. After a four-year legal battle, Louise successfully won her case and became the first transgender person to have their case for discrimination recognised by the Equality Authority of Ireland. I would advise anybody to take that route again if that situation happens. In my case, it set a precedent because transgender is now included under the grounds of gender, under the, under the nine discrimination grounds. A few days after Kay successfully changed her name and gender back home in the USA, she flew to Spain for her upcoming surgery. <laughs> so everyone always asks me why I come to Spain for all my surgeries. Uh, well, besides the fact that they're the best surgeons I've found, uh, there's also this reason. 
because it's gorgeous here and it's sunny and it makes it a lot easier to recuperate. Well this is the morning of the surgery. I didn't get a lot of sleep. Actually I didn't get any sleep. Um, so I'm pretty tired. I'm hungry because I haven't been able to eat and can't wear any makeup and just sitting here waiting for the taxi uh, and I just want to go to sleep so I guess the uh, I guess the anesthetic will be a welcome relief and uh, we'll just get in there and get it over with as soon as possible uh -oh. <laughs> I was there for two weeks, uh, flew in, the weather was gorgeous, it was 25 degrees, um, met with them, um, got their opinion, decided what we were going to do and then uh, went in at 9 o'clock in the morning and they put me right out and uh, woke up five hours later uh, in, the, in the recovery room. <laughs> they had me on a really good cocktail of painkillers, and as that wore off, it hurt so bad. Uh, so I'm home recuperating, um, I'm all bandaged up. It feels like every one of my ribs has been broken. Uh, I've got a stack of encyclopedias on my chest. That there's been nails driven into my armpits, which are all black and blue. Like of all the stupid things I've done in my life, like car accidents and horse riding accidents and cutting myself and uh, motorcycle accidents and uh, power tools. I don't think I've ever cried from physical pain before until uh, the things that I've done as a girl, which was laser hair removal, which hurt so bad that I was crying, and then the breast augmentation. And these are things that you never hear about how painful it is, which makes me think that women have a much higher pain threshold than men. The, the bulk of the pain was gone in a few days, but oh, it was totally worth it, yeah. Like, I wouldn't want to go do it again or say like, oh, wrong size, let's redo it. Like, it's done. I feel good. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, it doesn't change who I am, but uh, I like, I, I, I'm glad I did it. it. It makes me feel good about myself. Like I said before, I was trying to take baby steps to do just as much as I felt was necessary and no more. So I didn't know where it would end up. Um, I just knew that I had to make a change. I had to be living more authentically. Um, so I've certainly done that and I'm certainly happier and calmer. So um, I, cu I couldn't have asked for things to turn out any better than they have. Shortly after their performance together at Pride, Sam and his boyfriend split up. Well, Selah and I broke up, unfortunately. It just, it didn't end up working out. We broke up pretty gradually. It wasn't like an easy breakup. Uh, but then when he went home to Finland, uh, we kind of decided to take some time to kind of uh, get used to being single uh, before we kind of started being friends again. Relationships for me are really hard. I have all these situations where I'll meet somebody and I will like, instantly kind of go, oh wow, and I'll be talking. And then all of a sudden we're really, really good friends. And that's it. <laughs> and it's ha it happens all the time. They, they'll, they'll try and understand what trans is and they'll, they'll even maybe get it, but it doesn't mean that they'll be attracted to me. I always say that I'm looking for butterflies. That, that's usually what I'm looking for. Like somebody who can make me blush when I think about them. And like there's no kind of uniform quality that I'm looking for. It's just really somebody who, who can understand me and who doesn't care about the fact that I'm trans, but also I can talk to about stuff and that we have common interests. And basically the butterflies is the only, is the only quality that I like, I need that part. <laughs> Louise has worked in many different roles over the years, but now she has finally found her dream job. Well, my life has taken, career-wise has changed full circle. Um, when I was 16, my passion was uh, fashion and um, I wanted to do fashion media work and uh, my father and mother said 
you want to do what? But now at this stage of my life, I'm actually involved with photography and I'm often doing photographic work within the fashion industry and, and that gives me a great buzz because I'm actually doing something now that I get great satisfaction from. And I'm actually delighted because I, I just decided a couple of years ago or three years ago that I was going to do what I wanted for the rest of my life, not what I had to do. <laughs> so I'm now doing that and I, I absolutely love it. And, um, and if my parents saw me now, um, <clears throat> I think, I think, I don't think they'd actually be shocked. I think um, my mother certainly wouldn't be shocked. Um, I think my mother would be delighted. Um, as an only child, they wanted, they always said to me that um, they, they would have liked another child, a girl. So <laughs> um, they're, they're, I think they'd be quite happy that I'm now their girl. <laughs> yes, it has taken me quite a long time to get where I wanted. Um, but, I, you know, at the end of the day, you, you do the things that I did and, and you conform to society's norms of what people expect you to be. And um, in reality, that was an extremely hard road. When you're happy in your life and you're happy inside, you tend to be more productive. You tend to be more creative. And I suppose the fact that I'm now living the way I want to live after years of struggle, that uh, I'm delighted with, with the way I am. And, and I, I just don't, the, the word's my oyster. I, I, I don't have any boundaries that I, that I won't cross to, to be creative. So recently I've kind of been looking at uh, like basically just trying to get college started <laughs> and getting it, all my essays and stuff done. But also like with uh, the surgery in January, I had to really look at how it was going to get to America because there was no way I could have gone like with a female passport. Like it was, it, I would have been stopped at, at the airport. Like I, my voice has dropped way too much for me to go through in a female passport. So yeah, I went to the passport office uh, two weeks ago and I was talking to the people there, brought lots and lots and lots of documents because you need that for changing it and finally came up with a passport last Friday. So uh, yeah, I've got a passport for going to America and I don't have to use that, like, that name. It means so much. I mean, the fact that it's kind of like the government has officially recognised my gender. I mean, even though I'll not be able to get my birth cert changed until the new laws come through, like that's the closest thing to it. What's next? Uh, well, actually, I don't know what's going to happen after that surgery. There's a good chance that that'll be it for medical stuff for me. Um, and really, the only thing after that will be just kind of living my life. In five years' time, hopefully, I'll have finished my uh, my degree. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to finish it in two or three years or whatever. But then, hopefully, I want to do something, either a master's in human rights or maybe talk to Amnesty and get something abroad, like working in the human rights field and working for basically equality worldwide. Hopefully it's to kind of educate as many people as possible and make people realise that, you know, yeah, I'm trans, but I can do an awful lot. And it doesn't really impact on anything to do with me other than the fact that it gives me a platform to educate. Since her return from Spain, Kay has been approached by GCN magazine to write a column on gender issues for their new online magazine. And uh, we're going to tackle online dating, a lot of trans issues, um, talk about and explode maybe some myths about differences in gender as, as well as some actual differences. You know, I think some things that people think are gender differences or, or masculine or feminine traits are oftentimes uh, personality traits. So uh, just basically anything that strikes my fancy, um, even like gendered technology and, and how things are advertised to people. Um, so I have to go over and get my photograph taken so that they have the little picture uh, that everyone can throw things at. This has been a big transition year. Like, I feel like I've, um, there's been a lot of losses personally and professionally. Um, so the best thing to do is sort of throw yourself into your work. And it's good incentive. I mean, it, it, it's good uh, 
uh, impetus to to uh, to create. You know that you're feeling something. So, um, and I have uh, another uh, exhibition scheduled in March over at the College of Art and Design Gallery. So um, working towards that. So yeah, I'm and I've got a new drummer that I'm playing with, and so starting to work on the music and singing and performing again. So I've got the music and art and writing and just putting myself into that and trying to push as much out as possible.